Last week we talked about the importance of trusting God at his word, and we looked at Jesus Christ and the, his, the temptations in the, in the garden there, in the, um, in the wilderness, being tempted by Satan. And we saw that he was led there by the Spirit of God to be tempted, and sometimes God leads us, as they say, in mysterious ways. And we want to follow up that sermon last week with what we're looking at today. Looking at today, what Christ has for us. And um, I want to just tell us that and remind us that what he has for us is well worth the wait. Sometimes um, I was thinking about what I've been going through, and I'm, I'm happy to say that I haven't experienced any major difficulties during this time of uh, lockdown. But it's, it's a bit of an issue for me to try to shop. You know, I'm, I'm one of these guys, I like to go in the store, and it's almost like I'm on a ticker, on a time uh, limit. I get what I want, and I get out of there, and I feel like I've really done something. I haul off what I have to, the, to my house, and I enjoy it right away. But now I've been reduced to what we call an online shopper, and I'm not too good with that. I'm not too keen on that. I find myself buying things, things uh, I've made purchases. Money has come out of my account, but I don't have the items. You know, I have a confirmation number or I have an email, but I don't have what I paid for. And many times our, 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 our religious life or our spiritual life is like that. Our faith walk with Christ, where we are waiting on things that he has already purchased by his own blood. They are ours but we don't see them uh, fulfilled completely yet. And sometimes we can get frustrated with that. What God has for us, it can be difficult, but I want to tell you, friends, it's well worth the wait. Amen? All right, now we're there. Well worth the wait. We're going to look at a story, a few characters in the Bible, that uh, they suffered a little more than just waiting two or three business days to get uh, some items that they purchased online. And I think of the father of the faithful. What is his name? Anyone know? He's, he's, he's referred to time and time again in the, in the word of God as an example of faith. Abraham, Father Abraham, that's right. He has many children, right? So he knows something about waiting. So we want to look at his life and what we can learn from that. This is the call of Abram. Before he was Abraham, his name was Abram. In Genesis chapter 12, uh, verse 1, this is the first time that he would hear the promise coming from God that he would have a seed. And we want to notice how old he is at this time and what's going on. Verse 1 of Genesis chapter 12 says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation and will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be, thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Okay. In thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was how old? Seventy-five years old when he departed out of Haran. So this is God's initial call. The first time that uh, Abraham, or Abram at this time, would uh, hear the promise of God coming off of his lips, that he would have a blessing, and through him all the families of the earth shall be blessed. It's not very specific, but it gets better. Verse 8, And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls of the people that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Shechem, unto the plain of Moreh, and the Canaanite was in the land. We don't want to just gloss over that. God calls you somewhere, and you have a Canaanite in the land. He's going to promise you posterity. You're going to have a seed, but you have enemies there that are intent on you not being there and killing you. But God has called you to do it, so you feel good about it. Verse 7, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord, 
who appeared unto him. Now, at this time, how many children did Abraham have? Zero, a goose egg, none. Genesis 13, and the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. For the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I'll make thy seed as the dust of the earth. What a promise. So that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it, in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Beautiful promise. After these things, Genesis 15, so many things that happened at this point, says, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me? seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. Now, when you are going through a trial, is it okay to be honest with God? Do we have to beat around the bush? We could be straight with him. Abraham is saying, Wait a minute, you promised me something. I haven't received anything yet. To me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. God is making it clear. No, it's not going to be through an adoption. It's going to be through the means that people commonly have children. You're going to have birth through your wife, and it's going to come from your loins. Oh, what a beautiful picture. This is not as good as the one Ken had up. But uh, just a little, uh, not a departure, but a little, aside from the story, I can remember um, as a youth, I grew up in the city of Atlanta, and I thought stars were those 10 or 11 dots that I used to see in the sky, you know, with all the light pollution. I thought that that, those were the stars, but uh, I don't know how long ago it was, maybe 10 or 12 years ago, uh, my wife and I, we were going up to New Jersey, and we were driving, and we got into the Virginia mountains. It's like you're forever in Virginia. I don't know how many miles it is on that stretch. And it was like 3 in the morning, and my wife had just taken the wheel. I had been driving a good bit, maybe 10 hours or so. And she saw that I may be getting a little sleepy, and guess what? She's going to take over the wheel. So I give her the wheel. I get out, and she drives for about 15 minutes before she's getting sluggish, and I'm saying, wait a minute. (laughs) You sleepy already? God bless my wife. You know, she's not here. I could pick on her, but she got sleepy, and I believe God allowed that for a reason. Well, I got out of the car to take over the wheel again, and I almost could hear the, 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 the sound of, of something above my head. It was, and I looked up, and I was amazed. I almost had a heart attack. I had never seen stars like this. I could see the Milky Way. I could see colors. It was amazing. And so it was freezing cold as well, but if it was not so cold, I'd probably still be sitting out there. It was so beautiful. So I grabbed my wife. I said, okay. I didn't say anything to her. I said, okay, I need you to come on out. And I put my hand over her eyes. And I I tilted her head back, and I just removed my hand, and she saw these beautiful stars. She's from the Bahamas. She's seen them before, but she admits that that was probably the most beautiful display of stars that she had ever seen in her life. Now, keep that in mind. What what do you look at? What do you feel about yourself when you see something so glorious? I tell you how I felt. I smelled I felt tiny, like small, maybe insignificant. Then I said, wait a minute, I'm not insignificant because God would put all that on hold when man sinned to come and save him. So we're not insignificant. But it makes me feel like, wow, God is huge. He's awesome. And he has a plan for my life. Nothing is happening that he doesn't know about. And so I I think about Abram when he was called, when God wanted, wanted to solidify Uh, the seriousness of his promise to Abram, even though he had seen no children, he told him to look up at the sky. Verse 8 of Genesis 15 says, And he, this is God, brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And Abram believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And this is my little note, righteousness by faith. This is what we're looking at, right? 
All right, God was promising much more than Abraham was understanding or Abram was understanding. He wanted how many children? He would, he, would, he would have been happy with one. If he could have one son, and that maybe that one son, he could have a bunch of children. But here God is saying, look up at the stars of the sky. So God is promising something that Abraham can't even understand. So he's not only giving them physical posterity, but a vast multitude of spiritual children who was sharing his experience of simply taking God at his word. And praise God, we have some of Abraham's children in the house today, and hopefully online as well. Genesis 17. Now this is Abraham. His name has changed. Uh, it's beautiful when God changes your name, isn't it? Verse 1, and when Abram was 99 years old, how old was he when he left? Well, how old was he when he got the promise, when he left Haran? 75. You know how long this is? Yeah, it is 25 years if you count. Yeah, it's 25 years. And lo, a beautiful vision just walked in. That's my wife. So when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face. And God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. How many children does he have right now? Zero. Neither shall thy name be any more called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. Anyone know what Abraham means? Kind of explains it right there in the text. <laughs> yeah. A father of many nations. It means a father of a multitude. His name before that, Abram. It means exalted father. So not only that do I think his name pointed to him as an exalted father, but how he, and he did some incredible things. You know, he, he rescued his nephew Lot. And there were many spoils that would have come to him in that, war, in that, in that uh, victory. But guess what? He told those kings, no. I don't want any of it. Just give me the people that I free, that God has allowed me to free. You keep the money because I don't want any of you to say that it is you who made me rich. He wanted all the credit to go to God. So it wasn't that he was such a great person, and he was. But it, everything that he did, everywhere he went, he built an altar. He exalted his father, God. So his name was the Exalted Father. And he went from that to being a father of many nations. Even though this is a great prophecy and a great thing for God to do, it's a little bit ironic because, once again, how many children does he have? Zero. He said, a father of many nations have I made you. God said unto Abraham, as for Sarai, thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai. We, have to, we don't need to forget that, you know, he does, he's not going through this alone. He has a wife. And uh, God, she is waiting on God's promise as well. So her name shall be Sarah, not Sarai, and I will bless her and give you a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And Sarah that is ninety years old bear? This is letting us know. It's a little exposition letting us know how old they are. And God says, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. So easy. Look at what I have, the, the highlights there is to show he's blessing her. It shows you how old they are. And another thing that could be highlighted is not only are you going to have a seed, but your seed is going to have seed after him. All this is in the promise. So here we are, Genesis 21, 25 years later. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. Would have been nice if, if God could have said, in 25 years you'll have a son. He didn't know it at, at that time. And it would be awesome, you know, another part, after he got the son, he was tested. It would be nice, you know, if Genesis 22 began with, and at that time the Lord tested Abraham, and he told him it was a test. Uh, Abraham, this is a test. This is just a test. It would have been nice 
for him to do that. But no, that's not how God works. Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, who Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And I know he was so happy and so proud uh, at that moment. What about a man named Moses? We know about him. Before we speed past his life, I want to just remind us that serving God is not a mountaintop hopping experience. We don't ascend into glory, but like Christ, we descend. Look at um, Moses. He was called from birth. You know that, right? His name means to be drawn from the water. To be drawn from the water, he was um, marvelously protected by God and also his sister, you know, on the river going through his hippopotamus and all kinds of things out there. That was a pretty scary thing to do to put your child uh, to float on a river. But even as he grew up, he spent 40 years in Egypt. Now, you have to have that faith that you're called of God for a purpose from birth. But here you are, 40 years in Egypt, another 40 years in the wilderness tending sheep. And little did he know that God was preparing him for his assignment as the great leader of Israel for another 40 years. We can think about David as well. Remember him being anointed king? Beautiful story. He wasn't even being considered. His father didn't even want him to come out when Samuel the prophet came to anoint someone in that house, the next king of Israel. He wasn't even considered. He was out in the field. And for God to call him out and let him go through all these people who were more strapping, more impressive, their resumes were better, but he had a plan for David. And David comes out, and God says, this is the one that will be king. David didn't know. He was just minding his business. But he had built a relationship with God that God was ready to honor him. Now, he's about 15 years old when that happened. So God calls him, and he's anointed as the next king of Israel as about the age of 15. Okay? Did he immediately take the throne? Didn't happen. And he was anointed like three two other times, but he didn't immediately take the throne. He went back to tending stinky sheep. Little did he know that this was his preparation for his assignment as a great king over Israel, and he ruled for 40 years. All right? This, uh, this is the final anointing. His first anointing was private, something that he, Samuel, and his family knew about. And then a little after that, he would battle Goliath. You saw how much his brothers really respected him as the next king in that story. Kind of forgot about that. So it was kind of private. But then God does something amazing in this story. He acknowledges him and makes it public. 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 1. Then came all the tribes of Israel to David. Wow. Unto Hebron and spake, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. Also in time past, when Saul was king over us, thou was he that led us, us out and brought us in Israel. And the Lord said to thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be a captain over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron. And King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. Not something that's taken place in a back alley, in a room, somewhere that you have to hear about it. He's doing it publicly. He's acknowledging the faithfulness of his servant. David was how old? 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years, 30 minus 15. That's about 15 years between the initial promise and its fulfillment. What patience. And, you know, some of that time he spent running from Saul and living in caves and hiding. His life was not very glamorous, but he knew that he had been called of God. He didn't try to take it into his own hands, but he trusted in the leading of God that when it was time that God would appoint him. It's kind of rough being anointed and not being yet appointed. I know a little something about that. It's kind of rough, but I'm thankful that God is able to keep us in those times. Now, we're dealing with faith. This is what God is doing with us when he's allowing us to wait. And I want to remind us that what God has for us, whatever he has for you, is well worth the wait. So hang in there. Hebrews 11, verse 1, we all know this verse. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. 
through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So important to remember that God spoke things into existence that were not there. This is the power that we're dealing with. This is what we uh, are dealing with when we're talking about God, our father and Jesus Christ, his son. They're able to speak things into existence. They're able to resurrect marriages that are on the verge of despair. They're able to recreate a new heart in us, in you and in me. So there's the word of God that is central to our faith. By faith, Abraham, we just talked about him. When he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for inheritance, he obeyed and he went out not knowing whether he went. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He was looking for something more. What about Sarah? Through faith, also Sarah her, uh, herself received strength to conceive seed. It took her some faith on her part, did it not? How old was she? 90 years old? Wow. And she was, and was delivered of a child when she was past age. Why? And we remember her laughing, but look at what this sentence says. I love how God, he doesn't bring up your old business. Why? Because she judged him faithful who had promised. That promise didn't come from a man. It came from God. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. What a man. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is what? Invisible. We have to learn how to trust in the unseen. Right now, we may be focusing on circumstances around us. You remember the time when Peter was walking on water? He was doing fine until when? We say he took his eyes off Jesus. He started looking at waves and, 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 and winds and all of these situations and circumstances that God has power and control over. He concentrated on that and forgot about Jesus Christ and began to sink. And how many times have I done that in my life? Maybe you know something about that as well. But he endured because he was seeing someone in something that was invisible. Hebrews 11, verse 32. And what shall I more say? For the time will fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson, of Jephthah, of David also. There he is. King David, 15 years, you know, waiting between his anointing and his appointing. And Samuel and other prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, and stopped the mouths of lions. Who does that remind you of, stopping the mouths of lions? The good old Daniel. Well, how many of us want to please God? I know I want to please him, right? And so the Hebrews tells us, if we want to please God, something is key to that. Verse 6, but without what? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that what? Diligently seek him. Not every now and then, not just in a trial, but that diligently seek him. And we pointed out earlier that you can be honest when you're suffering, like God, you promised this. And I don't see it. I'm confused. I don't, I don't understand what's going on. My daughter, man, her, she, uh, she will tell me, Dad, you said this. And we're beginning to test some of that, you know. <laughs> she will say that. She knows that that's a formula that usually works, but sometimes you got to do some fact-checking on that. Did I really say that? But she will tell me quickly, Daddy, you said it. And that's how we have to be with God. That's what he wants. Because uh, unless we become like little children, we shall not see the kingdom of heaven. He rewards those that diligently seek him. Look at the, the hand uh, of the child in the father's hand. And that's us. That's what we want to be. Uh, we want to be able to say it to God in our worst times that I'll trust you. I don't understand what's going on. I'm not seeing it, but I believe in your word. So it's not just a fancy feeling that we have or some uh, misdirected hope, but it's based on something. Romans 10, verse 17, so then faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Find that promise in the scripture. And it's there. It took that thing a little while to get 
it's, a, it's funny that, you know, I was trying to communicate the desire for things to be fast. You know, there's an old cheer. You say, what do we want? We, we say TD, but you can fill in the blank. What do we want? You know, you want a promotion. You want uh, your, your marriage to be better. You want your children to return to the Lord. What's the other question? It says, when do we want it? We want it now. We be like, come on, come on, God, let's get this. Where are you? God is trying to teach us patience. What is God's purpose in allowing us to suffer like this? When we have to sit around 15 years to wait for something that God gave us. Or in Abraham's case, 25 years. How about Moses, 40 years in the the desert? Well, I know a little something about waiting. I don't want to keep you too long. But this moment right here was something that God saw. When he, before he called me in 2006. In 2007, I was completely um, assured that he had called me into pastoral ministry. And I kind of fought it, but, you know, he made it clear. Uh, one, you, you, have, you, have you ever prayed, Lord, what would you have me to do with my life? Have you ever prayed that? I said, Lord, please make it clear to me. By this time, I was a deacon in my church, and this is Friday night. I said, Lord, please make it clear to me. What would you have me do? This is about a year of serving God. And I said, I don't know. I don't need a star to fall from heaven. I don't need anything. But just, I know you can let me know. And I prayed this silently. I went to the deacon's meeting the next, uh, the next day, which was Sabbath. And the head deacon was calling me Pastor Muzon over and over again. And I'm looking around like, no one's noticing that he's calling me this. And so I still didn't, I say, wow, that's kind of weird. That's strange. And walked out of that meeting into the church service, and someone handed me a book. And I looked at it and said, How to Prepare Sermons. And I said, Wow, this is odd. This is a strange day. But I kept praying that God would reveal. And he did it several times. And even at our wedding, you know, we had a pastor. Our pastor prayed for us as a pastoral couple. And I don't remember telling him about that. He probably heard it from somewhere, somewhere else. But that was when I was seeking confirmation. God gave it to me. Now, I wish he could have said, Okay, in 14 years, you'll, you'll be a pastor. You know, it kind of would have saved me some heartache and some pain. <laughs> you know, but I wanted it when. I felt the call on my life then, and I wanted it right then and there. I've worked uh, several jobs uh, in blue-collar work and feeling kind of out of place, feeling like maybe I, I was let down. And even went, I went to school for this, y'all, by the way, <laughs> you know, in school, Is not cheap. And upon my graduation, it would have been nice if God could have said, well, about five years, I'll I'll have you settled in. You'll, you'll, You'll be pastoring somewhere. So we did. I did some. I've done ministry ever since I've come in. But pursuing interview after interview, trying to get a job at what God has anointed and I felt appointed me to do. Imagine going home, you know, from a warehouse job every day where you're thinking maybe next week, maybe a month, and five years goes by. It could be a little rough. So I know a little something about waiting, and guess what? Just as Abraham was not alone, my wife was waiting as well. And so it was a very weird thing. We were called up here, and we went through, some of you were there, we went through an interview. And I had already sent a resume, and I was even challenged by one of the members, well, what are your qualifications for the job? But being led by the Spirit of God, I said, I've already given a resume. I'm not here to to sell myself or to do that. I continue to talk about what God means in my life. And I found that if you, even when you make a mistake, if God God has something for you, it's nothing that you can even do to mess it up. Only really you are the only one who can do it. No devil in hell can take it from you. So I felt the confidence that night. And then my wife came in, and she kind of filled uh, the people in on some qualifications. I felt like things weren't going so well, and it reminded me of me waiting for my wife, the beautiful woman that you see sitting before you. And we went through, I thought about this when I was interviewing with the churches. My mind went back to how we had, I had surrendered my wife to God, that if it was not his will for us to be married, no matter how attracted I was to her, no matter how much I loved her, if she was not the woman that God had for me, then I would just, I would be willing to give that up. And coming to that point, 
going through marriage counseling. There are several people we could have chosen. Uh, there was a man that probably would have just gave us the okay. He would have just given us the okay and we'd have been fine. But there was another man who had a sterling reputation for standing and, and, and giving people the truth about this. People had kept his record and said everyone that he said should not get married. He did not feel that God had brought them together. And they did it anyway. Guess what their uh, divorce percentage rate was? It was 100%. And everyone that he said, you know what, I feel God has put you together. 100% success rate. Those marriages are still. I said, that meant something to me. I said, he's going to be. I want someone to tell me the truth. As much as I did not want to let her go, I was willing to hear the truth. And so we went through marriage counseling. And I'm going to tell you, friends, from my perspective, from an earthly perspective, it was an absolute disaster. I'm like, there's no way this man is going to say. I'm like, I'm, I'm already weeping. I'm already mourning the loss of someone because I feel like I, I, it's not of God. There's no way he's going to say this. All this stuff we revealed to him. I was in there telling my wife, hey, you know, stop. <laughs> I was trying to hide stuff. She was just putting it all out there. I was like, oh, man, she doesn't know what she's doing. So it, we come down to one of the last meetings, and he looks at us. I know he's going to say it. And I'm like, here it goes. I'm preparing myself for another heartache, losing again. And he says, the Lord has put you two together. I almost fell to the floor. I was so thankful. It's at that point, it's at those points, when you're willing to give up your most prized possession, that God can trust you. He can trust you with what you want so bad. And I wanted to serve God in this capacity. And I thought back to that when I was in that interview room. We said what we had to say. I felt the spirit of God moving. And so in the Lena Church District, we go into the little room. It's soundproof. I'm trying to hear, what are they saying in there? <laughs> you know, I wonder what's going on. I can't hear anything. I was like, is this going to be another setup? Is this going to be another setup for disappointment? And then Pastor Edge and uh, uh, Pastor Edge comes in the room. And I'm preparing myself for it. I'm preparing myself. Pastor Edge and Brian. And he says, we feel God has called you to this and you'll be a perfect fit. I almost hit the floor again. Now, if God could have given me that, if he could, get, could have given me the PowerPoint that I could skip to the end and see that, then I would not have struggled so much during the five years, the ten years, or however long it's been between my anointing and my appointing. And I have to give a lot of credit to my wife because she waited with me as well. And if I could have found it, I would have put a, a picture up when I graduated. Guess who had to one-up me? You know? <laughs> she, <laughs> so there's a picture of me. I was looking for it today, and it was gone. There's a picture of me and my regalia, you know. Can we even call it regalia? I just had a cap and gown. I graduated. I failed school 20-some years ago. And this was a big thing for me to be able to go to school and to finally, you know, to graduate. But guess what? Somebody had to do me one over, one better. She got her Ph.D. the same time, and she was awarded that Ph.D. So we have a great picture of us smiling. And you got it? Yeah, I should have, I should have asked you for it this morning. But we can see that that caused a lot of grief when a man is not operating in, the, in, in his ministry, something that he's been called for. I really couldn't celebrate some of the successes of my wife and even my children because there was like a pent-up frustration because I wasn't where... I needed to be, I felt. But now it all comes full circle, and guess what? This is just the beginning. We have a real work to do here, and I'm thankful that my partner in ministry is with me. But the point, I, the reason why I went into that is to, just to comfort us. Some of you may be in a waiting period. You know, what is God's purpose for us in these waiting periods? And why did I have that slide up there? Is anyone familiar with this? Okay. Uh, in 1972, there was an experiment. Uh, conducted by Walter Mitchell out of Stanford University. Uh, this is an adaptation of it. This is a recent adaptation of his experiment. Uh, I don't think that the picture would look that good if that was 1972. But in 1972, he took uh, you know, some young children, maybe age four or five, and it was a test on delayed gratification. And what he did, he had a, a white coat, a doctor come in, he had these children, four or five years old, and here's the trusty doctor coming to tell them something. They leave a marshmallow in front of the child. 
and they tell the child if they can withhold eating that marshmallow, when they come back, they're going to go away. When they come back, they could have two, right? And so they're trying to test how well these children, four or five years old, can handle delayed gratification. Now, this is an inter interesting experiment because many of us can't handle it, and we're grown. But these young children were submitted to it. And this is a, an adaptation of that recently. You could just see this little guy going through it. Waiting is not easy. Waiting is not easy. And you could picture yourself doing this as well. When we're waiting on something from God and it's not coming in our, in our time. There he is. There's the marshmallow. It's right there. It's right there. It's in your reach, but you can't get it, right? He's trying to hold on. Y'all, y'all laughing at this guy's pain. <laughs> hey, I feel you, little man. I've been there. I have been there. He's holding on for dear life. And you could, you could check this out yourself. And I'm not here to, to um, condone or to endorse the study. But it did, it did teach us some, some great, great things, I believe. Uh, those children who were able to, to pass this test, they followed them for 40 years, you know, through high school and all. They did, they did better with their grades. They got higher SAT scores. And they also meet a lot of other of, uh, life successes in a greater proportion than those who were not able to do that. And so we see that delaying gratification is something that is crucial to success in life. With that part, I will agree, because I'm raising, a t I'm raising children, you know, children who can't control themselves, or, or even parents who can't control themselves. What hope is there in, in winning this Christian race? It's a real problem. So I identify with that little guy. God's purpose in our waiting and in our trials. James chapter 1 says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. And I love this because this is kind of implying a message to the 144,000. You know, those righteous ones who will be here when Jesus comes. You can kind of make that connection. But he's talking about the scattered abroad children of Israel. He says, my brethren, count it all joy when you, are, when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. God is working on our patience. But let patience have our perfect work. Don't get in the way of it. Don't try to stop it. Don't go around it. Embrace it. Why? That you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Jesus is our ultimate example, friends. He's our ultimate example. He didn't have a, a skyrocket experience into glory. He descended into glory. You remember what Philippians says about him. It says, even though he was in the form of God, he took upon himself the nature of a servant. Well, that's a long trip from heaven to earth. A long trip. And where was he born? Beautiful hospital, right? Top doctors. He's born in a, in a, in a barn, in a stable. We all can identify with Jesus. He was, what was he raised? He came up on the right side of the tracks, right? They said, can anything good come out of that town that he came out of? Nazareth. And so you see Jesus of, Naz of Nazareth, that title is showing, look, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. If, you. if you came up on the wrong side of the tracks, if you had a hard life, Jesus can identify with you. So he's going lower and lower and lower. It says he humbled himself unto death. And not just any death. That's low enough, but the lowest death at that time that you could experience was even the death of a cross. So he went even lower, and he did that for you, and he did it for me. But he had something in his view. He had something in his view as he was walking by faith and not by sight. What was it that allowed him to go through this torture, through the agony, through waiting? Well, it was you. It was me. Hebrews 12, verse 1. And this is what we have to learn from Jesus. It says, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Who are those witnesses? We just looked at a few. Abraham, Moses, David. I could add my mother to that. She knows about waiting. She had a son that she was praying for for 18 years to be delivered from foolishness and addictions. And here I stand before you today. That, that promise was fulfilled in 2006. That prayer life began 
That prayer began 18 years earlier. It would have been nice if God would have said, okay, Mrs. Muzan, that, that prayer I'm going to deliver him in 18 years. She didn't know, and she never gave up on me. And so we don't want to give up, but Jesus is our ultimate example. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And I want you to pay attention that everything doesn't have to be a sin to keep you from, from getting in. Some things are just a weight. Some things you just don't have time for. They're going to make your race, they're going to make you winning this race, uh, make it impossible for you to do it. We want to be able to shave off that uh, excess and be aerodynamic, just like an athlete. So we need to monitor. What are we watching? What are we reading? What are we doing? Some things may not be a sin, but they may just be weights. He says, lay it all aside and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Praise God that he's, he's there at the throne of God. He's there now. He's doing a work now. But what about when he was going through this suffering? What, what allowed him to make those steps was him picturing his reuniting with his father and us in his kingdom for you and for me. That was the joy that was set before him. And we can take comfort in that, that when we're suffering now, that God has joy set before us. Even though we may feel that we're being scourged, that we may even feel like we're being disciplined by God. If you read Hebrews 12, if you continue to go down, it says, don't, don't worry about that. If you're a real child and he disciplines you, you know, what son does not receive discipline from his father? It says only one who has a father that doesn't care. If you're an illegitimate child, you don't have to worry about it. But he disciplines us. But like my father, when he used to discipline me, he still had good things in his mind for me. And we have to remember that God knows his plans for us, even when we're experiencing difficulty. I want you to see it today that God is well worth the wait. What he, is get, what he has done in Jesus Christ, you may not have seen it fulfilled fully in you yet, but keep trusting, keep believing it will come to pass. Jesus is our ultimate example that waiting, though hard, is very well worth the wait. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for your son. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your mercy. Thankful, thankful that you're the God of all comfort and you can cause us to comfort those who need comfort. Lord, you waited well and in the person of Christ. He waited well and we want to learn how to wait well. Lord, give us the patience to endure the waiting. Give us the, the patience to, to allow you to work on our characters, to purge us and to purify us. Lord, that we may be able to stand in your presence faultless. We're so thankful for every provision these things will not come from us, but Lord, we trust you that you can keep us from falling. We trust you that your word has a power to keep us from sinning, to keep us, Lord, when we can't keep ourselves. We trust our children to you, some who seem afar off, but Lord, you've spoken a word that if, uh, if we, we heed your word, that they will not depart from the way that which they were uh, brought up. When they are old, they will not depart from it, is your promise. You promised that. You'll contend for us and our children. I pray that you will give your people promises to hold on to, promises that may not be seen, but they're just as real as the nose on our faces because you said it. And, Lord, we count you faithful who was promised. We love you and we thank you. In the name of Jesus, amen.